You know, for three Sundays now, I put as my topic, your blessed life now. I didn't say your problem-free life. I didn't say your life that is Teflon-coated. I didn't say your life without trials. I said your blessed life. We don't teach triumphalism, but we teach triumph in Christ and because of Christ. Triumphalism is the idea that nothing will ever stick to you. None of the sorrows of this world will ever attach itself to you. Uh, that, that's not what the gospel teaches. But it teaches us that in all these things, in all these messy things, all these sad things that we may encounter, God leads us in triumph. And so your blessed now, life now is God's shalom, God's peace. God's blessing, God, God's words of favor now. Now, and the reason I put the word now there is because we think, well, I'll be blessed in heaven. I'll be blessed on the other side, or I'm provisionally blessed. But uh, there is a blessed life now. And I've quoted some of the Scripture verses. I think in my first teaching I quoted Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every blessing in Christ Jesus. Everybody say, in Christ Jesus. This is a phrase that comes again and again. I think in the second teaching I, I quoted from 1 Corinthians where it says, all things are yours, things present, things to come, things seen, things unseen. Or as Paul said to the Romans, you are heirs of the world. No limitations in God's family. Don't limit yourself. Whatever gifting and abilities God has given to you, oh, let them flourish to the maximum. You get your education. You pursue your career. You trust God. And so we talked about that. And then let me give you a similar verse today. This is one of those that really you can't just read it and fall asleep. You have to uh, really study it. But I'll read it today. Just leave it with you. It says in 2 Peter verse 1, Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. For his divine power has, not will grant you, but has granted us, not some things, but everything, everything, it's a big word, pertaining to life, whatever pertains to life, and godliness. And then it repeats it again, through the knowledge of him. So this knowledge of Jesus Christ in Christ there is the treasure for everything we need. So we, 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 we taught, we've given hundreds of teachings on the love and grace and provision and the covenant of God. But this teaching, your blessed life now, is about our response. How we respond to such grace, such favor. And in the first teaching I said, I taught on one thing, put God first. If we say, Lord, in light of this, that everything I need has been granted, it's there in Christ, I'm going to put God first. We talked about what that means. In the second teaching, we talked about dethroning mammon. You see, mammon is evil. Money is not evil. And Jesus spoke those radical words, you cannot serve God and mammon. You will love the one and hate the other. You'll despise the one and neglect the other. And so Jesus is saying, if you serve mammon, you will hate God. And if you serve God, you will hate mammon, that spirit of materialism, of greed and fear. Money can be used for good things or bad things, depending in whose power it is. And so we talked about that, just to put it in the context. Now I want to leave you with one more verse as I just finished this uh, teaching, it's from Proverbs. Remember, whenever we read in the book of Proverbs, we always filter everything through Jesus Christ because Jesus Christ has become our wisdom. So the book of Proverbs will not work for you uh, unless Jesus Christ is the activator. It says here, Proverbs 22, 9, he who has a generous eye 
will be blessed. Notice what it said, a generous eye. It doesn't say even a generous heart, even though that could be true, or a generous hand. A generous eye sees things with generosity. I call this, to paraphrase it, the power of a generous life. And, and you, you may you mean think, oh, he's going to talk about money now. No, well, I, it, it refers to money, so I may say something about that. But generous, generally have a, a generosity. The, the more we know God, I would submit, the more generous we become in our opinions. You know, some people, they think they're very generous financially, but they're very stingy with their opinions. They're very narrow. They're not generous. They don't allow for other people's opinions. They are very, always want to argue. You know, if anybody is opinionated in this room, it is yours truly. Don't look at me like that right now. I have opinions. You ask Pastor Nathan. He knows. I, you know, but, but you know something? I accept all kinds of people that don't exactly, even though I know my opinion is right. How many know your opinion is right? How, how many knew that already? Uh, but, 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 you know, there is a generosity of attitude toward others. I don't have to condemn everybody. We, we can have a generous attitude. You know, in, in say, take politics. That's why I see some preachers now, they are advocating for one party or the other. We never do that because um, we were too generous. TICC, Toronto Celebration Church, World Impact Ministries, we have a spirit of generosity. We, we're not saying, oh, if you have this conviction, well, you're excluded, and if you don't believe like me, I never feel like standing here preaching that this is kind of my pulpit or Pastor Nathan's pulpit to espouse whatever opinions we have. We are here to be faithful to the revelation of Jesus Christ. That's our job. And the rest, we are generous. People say to me, you know, people say, well, what, what's your church culture? You know, that's a big thing. We, you know, church got to have a culture. And it, it usually means that well, we are a youth church. And we are a young adult church. We are a senior citizen church. We are a, we are a, a church for, for families with kids. Or, or, or in our church, our pastor dresses like a hipster. In our church, our pastor wears a tuxedo. In our church, it's, people say, what's your dress code? You know what our dress code is here? Generosity. Come, whatever way you want to come. In the winter, we don't advocate wearing a bikini. In fact, I don't even know if I advocate it in the summer, but, 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 but I'm just saying, come, come. We, we don't have, we, we're not, we don't have a, a culture is generosity. Our culture is not that we have a certain kind of lighting and we have a certain kind of style and we do it this way and, you know, we are like this and that. And in our church, you know, we, we, we have certain coffee we serve and some churches is that we have a wine and cheese party after Sunday morning. You, you, we, that's not us. Our culture is everyone coming together. The church of Jesus Christ are all kinds of people. That's why I understand when people come to Canada, you know, they start a church named after their home country. They call the church, you know, we are the such and such church. We are the Swedish church. We are the Ethiopian church. And, and I understand it's to gather people who have just arrived in the country. But in principle, I don't want to use any word that limits us, that takes away from our generosity. I, I don't want to go to the Russian church or the Ukrainian church or the Swedish church, even though my, my ancestry is Swedish. I want to go to the church and be a part of the church of the living God, of people who are not a people, of people who are not our ethnicity differs, but we are all one blood in Jesus Christ, and we are brothers and sisters. So that's our culture. You know, I love reading church history. And so when I read the earliest creeds, you know, statements of faith like the Nicene Creed and the Apostolic Creed from the first centuries after Christ, you know what strikes me about them? It's not only what they say, it's what they don't say. They don't, they don't address a whole bunch of issues. You know, some churches, you look at their statement of faith, it's so full of instructions for how you should look and what you should do and how you should stand and how you should sit and whether you should raise your hand or not raise your hand. I love those early Christians. They didn't major in all those little issues. What the centrality was is that Jesus Christ is Lord. He was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He was buried. He went to hell to destroy principalities and powers. He is alive again. Oh, praise God. You see, there was a generosity there. 
And so generosity, everybody say generosity. It's a lifestyle. And the generous eye enjoys the blessing. So let me give you some point. Generosity is intrinsic in God's family. God so loved the world that he gave. When David had sinned and cried out for forgiveness, he said the following words, Psalm 51, uphold me by your generous spirit, not by your scrutinizing spirit, by your generous spirit. In James 1, 5, James says, God gives to all generously. See, it's a family trait. Say it with me. I'm in the family. So you may, you say, well, my father and mother were not generous, but you're in God's family now. It's a family trait. It says in, in 1st and Peter, we are partakers of divine nature. So I don't care what you say about yourself. You are generous. At the core, you are. You may have camouflaged your true personality by all kinds of things you think that you got from grandpa and grandma, but at the core, when you know God, you are a generous person. Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm generous. It's in my DNA. Oh, I see some of the wives looking at the husbands and say, hand over the credit card. That's not what I meant, all right? But, but, but what I'm saying is this, God is a great lover. And great lovers are great givers. That's why we say you can give without loving, but you can't love without giving. You know, there's an expression I don't like. It's the expression new normal, but I want to use it right now. Generosity is a new normal when we accept Christ. Pretty good fitting that word. You see how woke I am? I got all these words, the new normal. Everybody say new normal. So if you say, I, was, I, I wasn't, you know, we, we were always squeezing everything and holding back, and we didn't want to be too generous in our attitude, and we were non-accepting. Well, you are in a new family, and there's a new normal. It's generosity because our Heavenly Father is such. You know, when David was uh, participating in generosity, he said like this in Second, First Chronicles, who am I and who are my people that we should be able to offer so willingly as this? He said, well, I mean, why should we do that? Why should we be so generous? Come on, TICC family. After we've already heard about the gas prices and the food prices and Tina reminding me how much beef costs. She just told me this morning. Wouldn't believe it, Peter. And I filled up my gas tank this morning, so you don't have to remind me I broke an all-time record. And so we can say, why should I in this time be generous? This is what David said. Well, well, what's about that? Then he says, for all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. So he's saying, here's the reason why. Because God controls the inflow and the outflow. Everything comes from God anyhow. He can turn on the tap a little bit more if you need that. We are stewards of God. What he's saying, if I paraphrase it, is generosity is my response to God's generosity. Keep that in mind, because we have sometimes heard, you know, you need to give, you need to be generous with God so that God will bless you back. No, that is putting the cart before the horse. All generosity starts with God. It doesn't start with you being generous to God and giving and giving of your time. And it all starts with God. Everything flows from God. God is generous. He has demonstrated his generosity. His nature is generosity. And in response to my understanding of that, I say, oh, my God, what shall I do? How shall I respond to this? I am not being generous in order that God will be generous to me. I am generous because I'm overwhelmed with his generosity. His generosity to me. I don't, I don't give to get from God. I give because he has given to me, and the cycle continues. So I can be generous. I can be like the Apostle Paul was in Acts 17 when he came to Athens and saw the idolatry and the idol worship and the paganism. And first he got a little bit mad, but then generosity took over. And he said, I see you folks here in Athens. You're, you're seeking after God. 
you know, you're very religious. He, he started to speak nicely. You see, that's, that's how we are. It's not that we agree with every form of paganism that may be spreading in our culture, but our God is generous. When he saved me, when he saved you, he, he was very generous. He upholds you with his generous spirit so we don't have to nitpick. Let people come to us. I had one of my neighbors come and visit me recently with Tyna and I, and he was deeply moved by the Holy Spirit. I prayed for him. And then he said to me, Peter, I learned one thing about you. You're different than any other type of evangelical Christian I've known. He says, you don't tell me nothing till I ask you. He said, you just keep baiting me till I ask you. And boy, then do I give it to him. Because I don't need to push my opinion on everybody. I, wanna, I want just the fish to look at the bait. Are you with me? Sometimes you, you preach too much. You're trying to be so anxious and you use words that nobody understands, you know. People talk about Pharaoh this and, and Egypt that. And stick with Jesus. Come on, turn to your neighbor and say, stick, to, stick with Jesus. Generosity opens the door to increase. Look at what it says in Deuteronomy 15. You shall surely give to him and your heart should not be grieved when you give to him. This really spoke to me because, you know, there was a time in my life where I would sometimes teach on giving, and I would say, you know, God spoke to me to give an amount, and I didn't want to give it. I was grieved, but I gave it anyhow, which was pretty good. At least obedience is better than sacrifice. But then I realized, you know, that's not God's best. That I say, yeah, I'm going to obey you, Lord, but I sure don't feel like it. Here it says, give and, and don't be grieved. You know, God loves a cheerful giver. And it says, because for this thing, the Lord your God will bless you in all your works and in all to which you put your hand. God likes that. When we are not sorrowful, begging, pleading, miserable. You know, the, the new covenant application, I put it this way, sorrowful generosity is no generosity at all. It, it just, you, you say, oh, well, I, I want to do it, but I sure don't feel like it. You know what, what the Bible calls such a person? A miser. Not a miser, but a miser with an S. That's why we tell you, please, go in the giving line when Pastor Nathan and I gives you opportunity to give by going in credit card and debit card, because most likely you're not going to marry a miser if you're looking for a husband or wife in that lineup. They're givers, you see. And, and misers are not fun to be with. You know what it says in Proverbs? Don't eat the bread of a miser. You go to a miser's house, and what does he do? He says, nor eat his delicacies, for as he thinks in his heart he is, eat and drink he says to you, but his heart is not with you. So a miser, you come to his house, and he says, oh, help yourself. And then he says, that's your second cookie. <laughs> he's, he's keeping count. Oh. You just had a little cup of my blueberries. That's the second cup. But he said, oh, welcome. Mi casa es su casa. Uh, uh, you, you know, he said, you, you want to stay away from a person like that? Everybody say, that's not me. Eat and drink, he says, but his heart is not with you. So as he thinks in his heart, he is. So, so, so I'm not talking about a pretend miserly attitude. I'm talking about a generosity that is who we are because we are in God's family. I say like this, givers are happy, takers are miserable, also known as miserable, but takers are miserable. Everybody say again, that's not me. So that's not what we are looking for. I'm so glad that we're not running some operation where we say, oh, oh, you know, we, we, we just, no, we don't want people to be unhappy. We don't want you to be grieving. But there is a supernatural joy in being in flow with God where your life is a channel and God has given everything and you have faith and boldness to, to smile and give you time and volunteer and join in the children's department or give of your offering, be in heart for the house. There's a joy in that. There's, it's who you are because you say, I can't wait. I know God is going to bless it if I, if I give generously whatever it is of time or smile or attitude or finances, I will be blessed generously. It will come back to me. It's a joy in that. And you know, we have many examples of this. The widow who was about to die, 
She gave her bread to the prophet. And it was the last she had. We, we talked about that. It says, if you have a little, that God is especially interested in people who don't have very much. Because he says, whatever you do with a little will determine how much you can hold. And so, you know, when you're flat broke, that's a good time to give, by the way. I hope you're not flat broke. But if you are, that's a good time to give. Because the harvest in God's hand is always bigger than the seed in your hand. You know, God has so many ways that he can increase us. He can help you cut some of your expenses. Oh, that went over great. I felt, I felt the strong anointing on that. You know, God can help you cut some of your expenses. Now I see some of the husbands smiling. You've been sour looking the whole service. No, but it, it, it can't go either which way. You know, but God can help you to find ways or he can increase your income. You know, just having peace of mind is a great necessity to prosper. Because if you're in, in, in angst, in anxiety, and your mind can't focus, you could lose your job. You could be demoted. But just peace of mind to say, God is my source. I, I, I have peace. I'm not in anxiety. That's a great gift of God to help us to increase. And God gives you ideas. He helps you when things are tough, when you're attacked by sickness or affliction or sorrow or, or, or a great loss. I say again, we are not triumphalist, but in all these things, we are more than conquerors. When, when, oh, oh. Go ahead and clap good if you're going to do it. Now, now, uh, you know, when I think of generosity, I must think of Abraham. And it says in Isaiah, look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who bore you. For I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. I always think, lonely Abraham and Sarah, just the two of them. I called them alone, and they had the blessed life, and that meant they were increased. And isn't, isn't Abraham the example of generosity? When his nephew, who really he had no particular obligation to in the context, he wants to take the best piece of real estate for himself. He says, I want the best, most fertile ground for my cattle. And Abraham has generosity to say, take whatever you want. But if you want to take that, take it then. I'm not going to fight over it. And in fact, what happens in that story is that when Abraham flows in that generosity, another door opens, and God says to him, now, okay, now, now we can do more business, you and I. He said, he says, in fact, look as far as you can to the east and the north and the south and the west, because everything you see is yours. And then another occasion, when there was a war situation, and there were certain kings who wanted to reward uh, Abraham, but maybe there were some strings attached, and they wanted to give him the spoils of war. He says, no, I, I'm going to have to say no to that, because I don't want any of you to think that you made me rich, that you prospered me. I want everybody to know that God made Abraham rich. I mean, come on, give the Lord praise. Uh, you, you see, he, he had that generosity. He said, I'm still in the book of Isaiah. I'll be quoting here now, uh, 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 Isaiah 32. A generous person devises generous things, and by generosity he shall stand. Isn't that interesting? A generous eye thinks generously, devises, fantasizes, imagines ways to be generous. That's, that's a beautiful characteristic. And, 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 and by generosity he shall stand. So generosity is in the nature and it leads to our, when our nature is generous, we, we, we want to do generous things. And in the long run, it gives us longevity and perseverance. How many want to have longevity in the times in which we're living? Come on now, let me see your hand. You, you don't want to just be, go, go wayside. No, it, it helps us to stand. Now, when we talk about generosity, let me caution you. It doesn't mean frivolous, thoughtless giving. Just still quote from Isaiah, just a few verses from the one I quoted. The foolish person will not be called generous. So I'm not talking about foolishly just, you know, I'm just, I'm just, you know, giving, giving my time. I'm just giving whoever asks me. I'll give. No, it, it, it's, it's being wise, not being a fool. For, for example, let me, let me give an example here. So in our heart for the house, we have many things we want to do. One of the things we want to help hurting people 
especially hurting fellow believers in East Ukraine. Now, you know, I mean, who can see what we have seen on television without your heart being moved, right? There are innocent people that are really being hurt. Now, for me, I'm still not going to be a fool. I know, still know that before this war started, Ukraine was one of the most corrupt countries in the world. It was a center for sexual, uh, sex trafficking, human trafficking, prostitution. And so I said, I don't know that all the people there who were doing all that corrupt stuff, they didn't change overnight and became saints, but yet I wanted to do something. So I'm saying, I'm not going to be a fool, but I'm going to be generous. So before we presented it to our church, we, we, we didn't just go and say, oh, well, let's just, let's just, whoever says Ukraine, Ukraine, let's just send the money. Like, like I went to a certain store this week, and, and I was paying the bill. And they say, you, you want to you wanna give a donation? You know, that bugs me. So I said to the cashier, would you like to give a donation to my favorite charity? Oh, that, no, I mean, I mean, seriously, like I, uh, everybody suddenly put up a sign here. I don't know, I don't know. Going to some big kidney somewhere, ending up in a bank account in New York. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. Are you with me? So I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking about just foolish, oh, I'm a generous person, I don't care. You know, I don't, no, no, you care. So what we did, I hope you're happy with that church family. We waited. We didn't respond as quick as some did, but we found out how can we get this to trustworthy pastors in the Donbass, East Ukraine region? How can we get to them? What is the way? What do we do when we get to the border? How do we make sure that the food and the, and the more the articles that they are, are scarce, that they get there. And I'm telling you, when, when Pastor Nathan, hopefully in a couple of weeks, will show you some of the pictures of what we did, you will say, that was good. It wasn't foolish giving. It wasn't giving to make us feel good. It was given to, for a purpose. So I say, I, we, we believe in generosity with a purpose. Everybody say, generosity with a purpose. Oh, come on, say it stronger. Generosity with a purpose. Some, you know, sometimes giving is to appease guilt. But I'm not talking about giving so that you don't feel guilty. I'm talking about giving because generosity is in our nature. You know, I was talking to a missionary uh, person who was raised in a missions family, uh, spent years in Africa. Uh, her parents were missionaries. She said, you know, the worst thing we had was when we got all these boxes of used clothes. I said, why? Well, it costs so much in customs to release the boxes. We could have paid less for the clothes in Africa, plus nobody wanted the used clothes. But everybody who gave them felt good. Are you with me? It's like one time I went to Israel, people said, can you take a suitcase of used clothes? I said, have you ever been to Israel? They don't want to wear your used clothes in Israel. I'm sorry, I know that's devastating, you see. I know. Well, they don't. I've been to the poorest neighborhoods in Jerusalem. Believe me, they don't want your used underwear and socks. I promise you that, all right? But, but we, do, we do, I just feel so good. I gave my used underwear and socks, and oh, they're going for God's work. No, no, come on, come on. Turn to your neighbor, sir. Let's be smart. Let's be smart in generosity. Let's have generosity with the, oh, come on. Don't look so shocked here right now. Give the Lord a hand or give yourself a hand to do something here, all right? So I'm talking about generosity. Everybody say Generosity. <laughs> And another example, of course, is the Macedonian church. In 2 Corinthians, we make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches in Macedonia, that in, in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their liberality. So they were poor, and they were still generous. So they abounded into generosity. According to their ability, they're thinking, what can we do? And then beyond their ability, what can we believe God for? They were thinking, how, what else? That's how we are thinking. That's why we, you know, people say, why do you do this heart for the house campaign or rise and build? Oh, why do you do that for? Don't you know it's hard times? We need to do it even more if it's hard times. That's why I told you. It was hard to tell people that God is our source during the COVID thing because you were all receiving a check from the government. So I could stand up here and Pastor Nathan till the cows come home, talk about how God is your source, and you were thinking, oh, no problem. I got a check coming on Wednesday. Uh, but now you're not getting it anymore. So I can sense you're listening more. But the truth was, at that time and now, 
God is our source. Can I hear an amen? <laughs> and so generosity makes us say, what can I do according to my ability? What can I do beyond my ability? And this is, they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. This is how I see our, you know, I, I, I keep bragging about you all the time. I do. I try to control myself not to brag too much because they may think I'm proud. But we have a generous church. We have people who volunteer, give their time, give offerings, participate in extra challenges. I'm happy. I'm happy. G -g give Jesus a big hand for working through you. But we have a giving family. You know, my friend Wayne Myers, I had to put this in, who was a dear friend. He's over 100 years old now. He used to say this. Put it up on the screen. If you want to be rich, give. If you want to be poor, hoard. If you want to be needy, grasp. Just grab at anything. But if you want to have abundance, scatter seed. Oh, that's a good one, isn't it? And here, I'm coming now to the best part. Are you with me? Generosity motivated by Jesus Christ. This is, we preach Christ. And what motivated the people in Corinth, for example, in Macedonia, was Christ. This is what they put right in the middle of talking about generosity. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that you through his poverty might be rich. So it, it was their vision of Jesus Christ that made them take their foot off the brake on generosity, take the limits off. So it all depends how we react to Jesus. You know, in the Gospel of Luke, there's a story of two men who had a different reaction to Jesus. The one man was very religious. He was trained in religion. He was, uh, for today we would call him a doctor of theology, uh, and, and he, he had graduated from a theological school. And he had an encounter with Jesus. And he was very braggadocious, very arrogant. He said, oh, I've, you know, I've been all my life, I've kept the commandments. I've done everything. And he's full of, and then Jesus says, what about your money? Oh, then he got nervous. He says, why don't you sell what you have and give to the poor? And he says, he went sorrowfully away. Sorrowfully. He was grieving. He was thinking, I thought I could have had eternal life. But no, he went away. In the next chapter of the same book, there's another person who has not been to theological seminary. He doesn't have his doctorate in theology. In fact, he probably knew very little. He was a gangster, a mafioso. If any mafiosos are here, this is for you. I'm including you in my sermon. He was a mafioso. He, he, he was the godfather of Jericho. His name was Zacchaeus. And he had an encounter with Jesus, and Jesus didn't ask him to give or, you know, Zacchaeus, you need to become generous if I'm going to bless you. If I'm going to come to your house, Zacchaeus, I tell you, I'm not going to come until you write a big fat check for Jesus Christ Incorporated Ministries. No, Jesus just came to his house, and he was so overwhelmed. He says, I, I want to just, anybody I robbed or ripped off, I'm going to give them 400% back. Come on now. That, that's an encounter with Jesus. You can, oh, give the Lord a big hand. You see, you see, that first guy, the religious guy, he was like it says in 2 Corinthians 9, it says, don't do it grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. He was all grudging. He was saying, well, what do I have to do? What's the necessity here? What do I have to do? You know, we don't operate our church that way. One time I had a, a, a couple of families join our church, and they were so amazed about how, how we received offerings. And they gave you, I'm not going to give you the denomination, but it was a fairly large denomination in Canada. They said, you know, in our old denomination, in the beginning of the calendar year, the elders would take a certain number of families in the church. They come for a home visit. The only time they ever visited, once a year the elders would come, and they would sit down at our kitchen table. They described this to me. And they would say, what is your income, ma'am? Sir, what's your? How much money do the kids make? And how much are you going to give this year? And then they would write it down. And then they would say, God bless you. And they go to the next home. And they were saying, do you do that here? 
some of you look like you, you don't know what the answer is. The answer is no. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I'm glad we don't. I mean, whatever. I, I guess it worked good. They could budget. Oh, this is responsible. We are budgeting. You know, we, we, we went to him. Aren't you glad that Pastor Nathan isn't coming home to you, Sister Essie, to check out everything? Aren't you glad for that? How many can give Pastor Nathan a good hand that he's got better things to go than go and snoop around in your, in your checkbook? Amen. So what, what we do, we actually trust God. That's a novel idea. We actually trust that God's nature is in God's people. They are generous because they are hooked up with God who is generous, and they will flow in generosity. And we give a little two, three-minute pep talk on Sunday about tithes and offerings and giving because we believe God is at work in you. And we know God loves things done freely and willingly. So, you know, that could be, I was thinking of that in that church that, the, the, the elders will come and look at everybody very sternly. How much do you make? You get tips too? You know everybody feels really pressured. I hope nobody's advocating this new style. Is it all right, Carrie, if we keep on as we are? All right, Carrie is with us to keep, keep going. You know, God loves things done freely and willingly. Even in all things, you know, I've heard people say, well, if it wasn't because I'm afraid of missing the rapture, I wouldn't even be a Christian. You poor sad thing. I tell you, I'm not a Christian because I'm afraid of something. I actually like being a Christian. <laughs> I, I actually like to be in partnership with God when it comes to finances, for example. I, I like to be blessed by God. I like that my God is blessing me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, if I was to tell you my story, and I will some sometime, you know, people have sometimes been mystified how I was able to do what I did. There was a rumor that went around a number of years ago that I was hooked up with the Russian mafia. Oh, we have heard that you're connected with the mafia because they couldn't explain how I was paying certain things for the gospel. And I always said, well, if you know any Russian mafia, send them my way. I'll take the money. Unfortunately, I don't know any. They haven't got any money. But if it's coming, I'll take it. Give me, give me, give me. My name is Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. Uh, you see, people, I like to be blessed by God. I like to pray and talk to the Lord. I like to worship God. I like, I'm not here under constraint. I'm not giving with a gun to my head, thinking that if I don't do that, the devil is going to eat my lunch and I'm going to be cursed. I do it because Jesus broke the curse. He made a new and living way and opened the heavens, and the devourer has been rebuked by Jesus Christ. Oh, I better quit preaching here. I could say so much about generosity guards our heart. Where our treasure is, our heart will be there also. Generosity shows that my faith is real. I'm not just talking. It says in, in 2 Corinthians 9 that your giving proves the reality of your faith. Just, you know, just not all talk. Not all talk. I, I put a little line for you here as well. The smallest act of generosity is worth more than a truckload of good intentions. Look at that. Look at that. Leave it up there. Let's say it together. The smallest act of generosity is worth more than a truckload of good intentions. Say, so, yeah, well, I, I was thinking, I, I, you know, I really believe in this, and I was thinking of doing something. I, you know, someday, you know, I'm kind of planning and hoping someday. No, a small act of generosity is worth more than all the talk, and it proves that it's real. My God is real, and He's able in his generosity to make all grace abound to you. So I want to say next Sunday, when Pastor Nathan stands here and says, okay, we're going to conclude the heart for the house. Let's do it. Let's make sure that the expenses of Toronto Pavilion are covered for this year, what we have to take care of. Make sure that we can help those folks that have been so persecuted. You wouldn't believe how many disappearances and deaths there are in Papua. That we can help them get that Bible school fully established, that we could provide follow-up for 50,000 new believers, and that we could do that helping some of those pastors that we're already doing in faith that you're going to stand with us. And the other things, we would do that. 
let's make it a great Sunday. It's Pentecost Sunday. And you know, on Pentecost, people were generous. <laughs> they, 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 were, they, they thought they were drunk. I guess so. I guess so. They were coming, handing over their houses. They were saying, you're drunk. But they weren't drunk. Uh, they just had, had seen a glimpse of something else. Now I want to. So, so think about that for next Sunday. But right now, right now, it says God is so generous that he makes all grace about to you. Everybody say all grace. That means grace in whatever area. Grace that is greater than all your sin. Grace that is greater than all your failure. Grace for healing. Grace for restoration. Grace for your broken heart. Mercy flowing to you. God is able to make all grace come to you so that you have sufficiency in all things that you have everything you need for every good work, that you will lack nothing. And I prophesy to you this morning, God this morning is here by the power and the name of Jesus and the presence of the Holy Spirit, and grace for whatever you need is now flowing towards you. Oh, let's lift our hands and just thank God for his generosity that is flowing towards us. His grace is flowing towards us. God knows what you need. He knows exactly what is the deepest concern on your heart right now. Grace that is greater than all of our sin. You know, it says that Jesus took the sins of the world. That, that's a heavy load. The most we ever do is we bear our own sin. Maybe you did something, you bear the regret of that, maybe even a sense of shame, and that can be very heavy. Some people can, you know, have a, have a breakdown over that. Their, their soul has a hard time to handle it. Jesus took the sins of the world, and his grace is flowing to you. Grace that is greater than your failure. Grace that is greater than your hopelessness. Grace that is greater than whatever somebody did to you or hurt you or let you down so that you can even become generous towards people who you would normally say are your enemies. God makes sure that all grace abounds to you. Every head bowed right now. If you say, Peter, I need to receive this grace. I need to receive a new life from Jesus Christ. I need to receive forgiveness of my sin. Then I would dearly want for you to be included. In a moment, we're going to pray. And if you say, Peter, I need to receive Christ. I need to be restored to God. I need to know my sins are forgiven. Would you just simply give me a signal so that when we pray, I know that you mean it. I'm including myself in this. I want to receive this. If you say, that's me. Even if you have never received Christ or if you say, I've drifted away. Things have happened, but I want to be restored. Lift your hand way up high right now, all over this room. If you say, that's me, let me see. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Others, lift it up way up high. You say, I want to receive God's grace flowing to me. Lift up your hand. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. God bless you. I see that over there. Anybody else? That is so beautiful. Can we all stand for just a moment right now? Everybody stand up all over this room. And let's pray this prayer that I said I was going to pray. And I want everyone, not just the, 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 the people, the handful of people who lifted your hand. You're so precious. If there was only one of you, that would be great, but there were several today. But I want everybody to join in prayer with those. Would you say like this? Would you say, Heavenly Father, I receive your mercy. I receive your generosity. Your generous spirit. Thank you that my sins are forgiven. That Jesus died for my sins. Come and live in me. I receive the new life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, live big in me. I change my thinking. I don't think my religion will save me. Or my own good works. I trust in Jesus. Amen. Oh, clap your hands for joy right now. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Just play on the instruments a little bit softly here, Jermaine, whatever people you need up here. Let's lift our hands way up high right now. 
I just felt like the Lord said to me, prophesy my generosity to the people. Prophesy my generosity. God is generous towards you. Maybe you have a physical need that is so personal that you say, I can't really explain it. I don't want it to be articulated publicly. In fact, I am aware, and I'm not even going to speak what it is, but it's a very personal thing. And I tell you right now, there's a healing virtue of Jesus Christ flowing into those parts of your body. Lift up your hand in the name of Jesus. Say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you are making all grace abound to me. Grace for healing, grace for restoration. I thank you, Lord Jesus. There's at least three people here who have even now that this uh, thing is over, but still this lingering sense of hopelessness, that fantasies of suicide has overtaken you sometimes. You fantasize and fantasize about it, and then it lifts, and then those fantasies come back again. Right now, God's grace is flowing to you. God is causing all his grace to abound to you. And on the basis of that, in the name of Jesus, I speak to every suicidal spirit, every suicidal uh, attitude in the name of Jesus. And I say, you must bow for Jesus Christ, because my friend, you shall not die, but you shall live, and you shall give praise to God. You shall worship God. You shall live and your life shall have purpose and energy and life in Jesus name I thank you father lift your hand up and praise God let me keep ministering for a few more moments I thank you that all grace and generosity is abounding for all sufficiency in the name of Jesus thank you Lord Jesus thank you Lord Jesus there are several of you, others of you being healed. God's grace for healing is flowing to you. You had damaged the discs in your lower back. It's not just that you have a back pain, but you have damaged some of the discs right there. And, and there's like a little, maybe they don't need, but what I see is like a little, a little tiny fracture so small, but it's causing you pain. Do you know that the one who created every vertebrae the one who created every part of your body, he is also the healer of your body. Lift up your hand right now. Father, I thank you that that damage in the vertebrae, in the bone structure, whether it's in the lower back or some other area possibly, in the name of Jesus, we receive healing right now. And the pain that has been symptomatic of that fracture, the pain that has been there as a symptom, so they knew there was something wrong, I speak to that pain to leave in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Father. I pray for those who have damaged any part of their skeletal uh, part of their body, any part of the bone structure that has been bo broken or damaged. Uh, I thank you that God's grace and generosity of healing is flowing towards your bone structure. Arthritis leave, rheumatism leave. We receive health and life in the name of Jesus Christ. And Father, we include every ailment, every pain. And I thank you that by the stripes of Jesus, Christ, we were healed. I want you to lift up your voice. I don't want you to listen for my voice. Lift up your voice and begin to thank and praise God that he has let his grace abound to you today in the name of Jesus. Thank you for your grace abounding to people. I give you praise. Oh, take another 10 seconds and thank God right now. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. I worship you, Jesus. There's about 10 people here who uh, before this last two and a half year scenario, whatever we call it, started, you had dreams in business. You had dreams to take steps to advance that might bring you more increase. And you even felt like the Lord wanted you to do it. But then these setbacks, you kind of lost your dream. I want you to know that God's grace for your dream is abounding to you. If he gave you the dream, his grace is there to restore it, to empower it, to give the wisdom and the energy. So how many feel like I, it's time to dream again? I know I'm not preaching on dreaming. I'm just flowing with what the Holy Spirit wants me to speak. Because God said, prophesy that all grace is abounding. All grace. That means I, I could go all day, I guess, because it's all grace for whatever area. But I'm just speaking this. If you say yes, there were some things I had planned to hope to initiate, to start, to grow, and then it was like everything was set back. Well, you know what? 
God hasn't forgotten, and I don't think you have forgotten, and he is with you. Wave your hand right now if you say, Peter, you're talking to me. Yes, I see you. Yes, yes, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. I, just, I can't even count. I thought it was at least 10, but there's probably three times as many. I tell you, lift up your hands way up high right now. Father, according to the word you gave me to speak to this congregation that all grace is abounding. I thank you that all grace for wisdom, for initiatives, for careers, for future steps is abounding. And I thank you even in the next seven days that they will get a clearer understanding and see clearer what the next step is in the name of Jesus. Oh, come on, give the Lord praise right now. Give the Lord praise. Give the Lord praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Glory to God. Oh, take your seat right now. Take your seat. I know God's touching people. First of all, if you pray to receive the Lord Jesus Christ, then go to the welcome table. They may have a screen telling you something there. We're going to give you some books and material. Just go and meet. I don't know if it's who it is. I don't think it's uh, Elena today because she's going to help me with the books. But Betty is there. Jenny, Jenny is there, okay? And so receive that, and that's important. And then, now I forgot what else I was going to say. Yes, I was, I was going to say, how many of you believe Jesus Christ healed and touched your body while we prayed and God's great? Wave your hand at me right now. All right, that's beautiful, that's beautiful, that's beautiful, that's beautiful. You know, I was on the first, well, look at all the people here. Give the Lord a big praise for that. I was... Uh, with the First Nations people, they built a beautiful church building on one of the reserves, and I think, I think about 80% of them needed to get healed, and they all got it. I don't know. I couldn't keep track of it. But there's a, quite a few here today that God has touched. That's beautiful. Are you happy to be a part of God's family? Turn to your neighbor and say, you know, I can't help it, but I'm generous. It's in my nature. Tell somebody. Speak it out. Confess it. I just can't help it. I'm just a generous kind of person. It's just uh, uh, not frivolously, not in a dumb way, but I'm just generous. Praise God for that. Amen. You know, again, <laughs> we are not generous to relieve guilt. I remember one dear Bible school graduate we had. She'd come from a church. You know what that church had done? They had used tea bag collection. They asked the people in the church to only dip the tea bag once in one cup, and then they would save the used tea bag and send it in a box to Congo. Now, I have some dear friends from Congo, and I know if I was Congolese like you, I would spit on that used tea bag and say, take your, no, I, no, I don't want to say anything ungodly here now, but are you with me, Alex? How stupid, right? How absolutely stupid. And people, so we're not that kind of thing. We're not, we're not just do good or we want to feel good. We want to feel good about ourselves. No, we are generosity on purpose. Everybody say generosity on purpose. Are you glad that we took the time, Pastor Nathan and I, for example, what were we going to do? How are we helping those pastors? Are you glad we took the time rather than just send the money? Uh, we did our part. How many are glad we took the time? Can I hear a little clap for that? Eh? Amen. Because we, so, so here's what we're going to do. Next Sunday is going to be a great Sunday. But you know, today is our mission Sunday. They just keep coming, regularity, heart for the house and no heart for the house or heartless for the house. We still have mission Sunday. I know you're not heartless, but we have mission Sunday every last Sunday of the month. And we put it there because otherwise we forget. In two months, we'd go by and say, oops, we forgot missions. But the great supreme task of the church must never be put just to a whim. It's a part of every month, and that's why we say the last Sunday of the month so that we don't miss it. Are you glad for that? So we have to receive our missions offer. We don't have to. We get to do it. Now, many of you know, let me take you behind the scenes for just 30 seconds. Many of you know that we made a decision so that next month I will be training up to 4,000 leaders in Tanzania at the Aga Khan Conference Center in Dar es Salaam. I purposely chose the Aga Khan Conference Center because it's Islamic, and I'm going to teach them how to reach Muslims. Then we have a campaign at the National Stadium. We purposely didn't go where all the other preachers go, which is the Christian neighborhood north of the center of the city where you have all the churches. We went to the National Stadium where 90% are Muslims. 
And we've been raising money. We are preparing for up to 400,000 new believers. And, and people are giving. But that's not what I'm talking about. So here's how, how, what you need to understand about what we are involved with. So while we are kind of focused and thinking, will we make it for there, other needs arise. So suddenly, Pastor Nathan says, we need to make a payment. I think it was so many thousands of dollars now for the uh, Bible school in, in Burma. It suddenly came due. Then I got another wire. They say, well, you know, we had 200,000 books for new believers over in Indonesia, and we've run out. They're gone. There was none left after your last campaign, Pastor Peter. We need to print 100,000 right away. And, you know, it takes a long time to print because they don't print as fast. So they say, we need to send right now 25%. So that was a few thousand more. While we're believing for this, you see, you're not a part of a small little operation that kind of have one project every two years. We were involved simultaneously in many directions. How many are glad for that? That's what the church of Jesus should be. You're not a part of just a, oh, we have a little project for the year, a little project. No, we have things going on continually. So we have no choice but to believe God. We have no choice. It's not an option for me. It'd be nice to believe God once in a while. I have to believe God. But what you do in our Mission Sunday helps us. And so, so we had to, okay, now we're going to print another 100,000 books in Indonesia, even though we're not going there till the end of the summer because they needed to get started. Then it has to be shipped, and it goes by boat and all that from the printer to the place we're going. And so if you could think of terms of 50, everybody say 50. Now, if 50 makes you choke, then please don't think 50. I don't want to call the ambulance on you because you're choking. Then you can think 25. But if 50 is so easy for you, then think 500 or 75 or 100, all right? But I'm just saying 50. Everybody say 50. I don't think you could buy these sneakers for 50. No way, Jose. I'm telling you, I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. Jermaine is the expert on all that. I don't, I don't know if you get those shoes for 50, Jermaine. I don't know where you shop. But everybody say 50. Because 50 will help you or will, will enable you to provide follow-up for 200 new believers. So that could be a good thing to think. Everybody say 50. Hallelujah. 50. But if you choke, please just lower it. But if you don't choke at all, raise it a little bit more. Amen. Can we do this? Because we want to. If you feel really burdened, I don't know what to do with you. But uh, anyhow, uh, just uh, put uh, muffs in your ears so you don't have to hear this. Uh, uh, you know, just uh, go out and we'll give you a free muffin or something. And, and Andrea wants to meet you. And I'll sign my book for you as well. And so, you know, um, all right. So can we do that right now? Do we have the red envelope, Pastor Nathan? We have the red envelope. Thank God. And don't put any used tea bags in it. I want something usable, all right? Uh, we're not stupid like that. We, we, we want to do real things to help people. So make your check out to, uh, in fact, Pastor Nathan, you come and do close this because I'm going to go over and sign books. I, I, I hope you don't, I hope you all go to see Aunt Andrea, but then come and see me. Otherwise, I feel very lonely and I'll need inner healing. So come at least say, say hi. And if you want to buy a book, I'll sign it for you. All right. I love you. Hallelujah. Thank God for a generous church. Amen. Over to you, Nathan.